again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Alumni Chats, a weekly podcast featuring alumni from the Department of Broadcasting and Journalism here at Western Illinois University. My name is Buzz Hoon. I'm the host of the podcast. Today, I'm talking with Steve Bridge from the class of 1999. Steve, thanks for joining this podcast. Somebody says 1999 to you, Buzz. It makes it sound like it really actually was a long time ago. <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking that you'll you'll never forget that because Prince made that year famous, uh, that it will always be able to uh, be a, a fond memory of when you graduated from WIU. That's it. Yeah. You know, what, one of the things I remember of being a, at work then at that point in time is where I spent that turn from 99 to the year 2000. So maybe we'll talk about that. Some of the glamorous <laughs> things that you get to do when you're in the news business and, and what you do with your, your so-called holidays. But 1999 and here I am, 2022. Yeah. And, and you look the same. You look great. Let's give everybody a life update. Where are you? What's going on? So currently I live in Springfield, Illinois. I am the agribusiness director at an AMFM radio station in Springfield, WFMB. Well, we're on 1450 AM, 104.5 FM. Uh, and that's as interesting as it sounds and, and probably as about as far from what I ever planned on doing in media as I, I could get uh, from 1999. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I also then help the statewide farm network run a news service. I cover a lot of stuff out of the state capitol and otherwise statewide news for the RFE radio network that is uh, run out of Bloomington and the Illinois Farm Bureau. I've done a couple other little things here and there along the way, but as far as kind of all the broadcasting stuff, that's where I'm at right now. And you got two teenage or around teenage yeah. boys that are keeping you busy. <laughs> I do, and today is the first day they are home from school. And so if it gets noisy or the dog barks at him, I guess we're going to we're going to find out why I haven't had a Zoom call. Um, oh, whatever the all of them that, that's called, you know, they, they haven't interrupted anything just yet. But maybe maybe we'll hear them or see them in the background if they're if they need my help, which is probably now unlikely because at 12 and 14, they spend more time not talking to me than they do talking to me. I'm married and my wife also works in media. She is currently a morning show host on a country music station here in town. And we had originally met in the city of Rockford and then moved here for uh, a career in TV for myself. And then she moved down here quickly after for a job in radio. And we've been in Springfield for more than 20 years now. Wow. And we'll get to that whole your journey of all the <laughs> twists and turns and how things have happened. But uh, it's, it's really, you know, to tell you the truth, Steve, we've had dogs join us, cats, uh, people uh, walking through uh, a back porch and so it wouldn't be unusual to see somebody in this podcast and we, we welcome them in. How's that? Okay. okay. We'll see what happens. So let's speaking of, of growing up because you are uh, from Macomb mm -hmm. and um, I, I always like to talk to people about, because I'm sure people that uh, got to know you uh, from WI, you always wanted to know what was it like growing up in Macomb, Illinois? It was really exciting. Uh, it was, you know, a, as great as the big city. And <laughs> uh, growing up in Macomb was probably as average and normal as it was for everybody else. But you'd asked me a couple of questions about our, our talk today and, you know, what it was kind of like to come to Western and being from Macomb, a perspective was really when I was growing up. Now, my dad worked at the university and it wasn't some place that we didn't go, but they were kind of two very separate communities. It, it wasn't, um, for me at least, it really wasn't like Western and Macomb were uh, always tied together. It was kind of these two separate little places. So Macomb was its own city and my, you know, I don't know, going to high school and everything else, we didn't think very much about the college. I mean, we knew it was there, but we were doing our own things on the other side of town or whatever. You knew that it got busy once student move in started at the end of August and you knew it got really quiet when students moved out in May or whenever students move move out of school now. But it was otherwise a nice, quiet little town with a whole lot of fun things to do. And I don't know, now that I'm old, I say it was a good place to grow up and it was a nice place. I understand why my parents wanted to raise kids in Macomb. Uh, the thing I liked about it and thinking about kind of the, the way my boys are growing up now, it was a lot of fun to live in like a town that small where you could ride your bike anywhere you wanted to go. You could, once you drive, you could drive anywhere you wanted to go. There wasn't anything kind of keeping you from one side of the town or the other. There wasn't a huge road or a big distance. So 
you knew everybody from all over town. You knew people from the little small towns around Macomb. And uh, it just made it a really fun, easy place to, to grow up. Yeah. And I've, I've heard that quite often. My kids both grew up here as well. And, and they say the same thing, kind of things that you've been saying about jumping on their bikes, maybe going to the pool during the summer or go to the YMCA, hang out with friends, uh, go downtown to the square, all those yep. kind of things. Waiting for <laughs> Heritage Days to happen. <laughs> Heritage Days. Yeah. All that stuff. And I, I was when, you know, every once in a while, somebody asks me about Macomb. So I I get on Google Earth and I, I look at where our house was growing up and I look at where some of my friends lived. And, you know, early on, it seems like it was a really far way mm -hmm. away. And then I'm like, wait a second, man, they, they only lived four or five blocks away. And yet it seemed so long if I had to walk there or if I was riding my bike all the way over to, to, to their house, it seemed like such a long way to go. And quite honestly, you know, it was probably no more than five minutes on a bike or I could walk to the Little League Park and play Little League Baseball at Patton Park and I didn't have to have my mom and dad drive me anywhere or get in the car and, and do any of that stuff. You, you were able to do a lot of it on your own. I think a, a small enough town that, that many years ago, maybe I was more independent than my kids are now, but it was really the opportunity to, I don't know, to, to just go and do what you needed to do at, at any, at any one time. Hmm. So what kind of things did you do in high school? I'm interested where you, where your sports guy, music, not music. Um, Mr. Goble, my junior high trumpet teacher, was uh, you weren't really allowed to quit band when I was at Edison Junior High, <laughs> except for Steve Bridge. He was allowed to quit. And uh, Mr. Goble, I think he almost smiled when I said, I'm probably done being uh, third chair or third row, third chair trumpet. I, I think I, I've had enough of this. So uh, music was not my thing. And uh, we never explored it very much afterwards in in high school played high school football I was I was okay I stood behind the starters and cheered them on I, I can't say that I was really all that successful or anything athletically I did at Macomb I enjoyed playing high school football though and for uh, coach Kelly Sears and coach Joe Molden and and those guys that were were there at Macomb and I found out that um, my high school football one of my high school football coaches Kelly was an assistant I think just recently retired at Macomb High yeah. other things at Macomb I say I got a lot more active and willing to do more things in college than I kind of seem to be willing to do in high school. And I'm kind of now, as we talked about my two kids, making sure that they're a little bit more willing to do different and active things in, in as they go through high school than before they get into college. But it was a quiet existence in high school, just tried to be a decent student and uh, participate in a couple of things that we could. And otherwise just took advantage of living in Macomb and running around with my friends. Did you mention something in your notes about um, having a, a class or something with Mr. K? And you're, I, I'm assuming you talked about Frank Kessler. Oh, uh, Coach Carabestos was. Oh, Cara, but okay, that was WIU. Yeah. Okay. That I was, was at Western. Yeah. What, what, I think we were maybe talking about some of my favorite classes or whatever yeah, else. Okay. And, well, well, we'll get to that WIU stuff. I wasn't yeah. sure if you were talking about Macomb stuff and, and WIU stuff. But uh, so. The decision to come to Macomb, as you had mentioned, there are two different kind of worlds. Um, wasn't, you know, was it hard? Was it easy to, decision to come to WIU? Um, I would say it was probably, it was probably a little bit hard to decide right away. Then the decision got easier. I'd taken a couple other school visits to a few other places, and there were schools out of state that I really probably wanted to go to and took kind of one long distance trip to Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And quite honestly, I didn't get accepted wow. into their broadcasting program. Uh, my grades weren't typically, weren't terribly fantastic in, in high school. They got much better in college. And so there was an opportunity to stay at home. Uh, I lived in a dorm, but there was opportunity to, to, to go to Western. Uh, my dad didn't get free tuition. I think we got something like half tuition. So there was an economic incentive to go to WIU as well. My sister had gone to Northern Illinois. Um, and pursued her career in education there in DeKalb. And looking around, I kind of remember saying to my parents, well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I live on, kind of on this side of the state. I'm, I don't want to go to Eastern. I don't want to drive all the way over there just to, to go do this. I could do this at Western. Southern seemed like at, at that point in time too, a, a really far trip away. And if I wasn't going to go to a couple other schools, I just thought Western would really work out. I liked the broadcasting program. I knew that's what I wanted to do when I was in high school and graduated at Macomb High. And Western clicked all those boxes and I kind of thought about, well, you know, 
is it, do I really need to go someplace a, a real far away? I just decided now, I think Macomb will work out for me just fine. So what's your earliest memory of, of getting involved in broadcasting, whether it was taking a class or getting involved with the radio station or TV? What, what do you remember? Well, I, I guess what I, what I can say I do remember is hearing my dad on the radio in WKAI mm -hmm. growing up with Buzz Hoon on, <laughs> on the board or, or working production that time. And my dad, who, uh, if, you met, if you met him, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily immediately think broadcaster, I don't think. But Buzz, he, you and him worked a little bit together. He did, what, a, a car call-in fix-it mm -hmm. show on, right. on a weekend morning? And so I kind of remember that a little bit, and I'm not quite sure if that then kept, you know, that connection going or whatever. Uh, but I took a couple, I was enrolled in broadcasting classes or whatever as a freshman at Western. And then Rick Bolger, who was the program director at WKAI. Great guy. I don't know if, if Rick worked, I don't know if Rick called me right away or if I called him, but they were looking for some fill-in help. And uh, another one of my high school classmates was already working at WJEQ, it was across the town, I think just kind of doing some board op work and every once in a while on the late weekends, getting on the radio. And all of a sudden I was filling that role at WKAI. And I was, uh, I think the first thing I did there was board op NASCAR races on WLRB. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, it kind of went from there. The first maybe school experiences, I think probably because I, I didn't watch the Channel 3 news when I was in high school that, that uh, uh, WIU put on, but probably seeing that, seeing the studio and thinking pretty quickly, well, that's what I wanted to do. And let's see if I could do that as a freshman. And by my second semester, I'm pretty sure I was at that point in time, full-time at WKAI. I worked for at least three years uh, eight to midnight, Monday through Friday there as a on-air disc jockey, as a, a, as a radio personality and still kept up with school and all the broadcasting work we did at Western as, as students. That is, and, you, and really it shows uh, a great work ethic that you were willing to take that on. I mean, it's, you know, you weren't, uh, it's not the hardest job in the world physically, right. but still, right. you know, there you, it's, it's a, uh, it's a routine. You have to be there. I mean, if you don't show up, and back in those days, I mean, you, you know, you had to have some automated backup. Yeah. And there were a couple of things that I, we had, I think it was, it was the end. It was like New Year's Eve into 1999. So it probably would have been like the end of 98 into the New Year's Eve of 1999. There was a huge snowstorm and I must've been at WKAI at the time, or maybe and my sister, so I remember she was visiting from someplace, she got stuck, and none of the morning people could make it to WKAI in the morning. And at that point in time, I lived literally, like, not even a city block. I was, I was less than 200 feet from the radio station where I had an apartment building on the square in downtown. And Rick called me, he's like, hey, if, if our guys can't make it in in the morning, can you be there at 6 a.m. And, and start doing something and giving giving weather updates? And sure enough, I, one of the morning guys didn't make it in. So I trudged down because I could walk to the radio station and help turn things on and, and got everything going until people were able to get in and, and start moving. And it was a lot of work. It was. I kind of look back on it and think, man, I worked five days a week all the way through college. But like you said, it wasn't, it wasn't you know, I wasn't digging ditches. It was uh, otherwise fairly enjoyable. But it was a nice way to spend uh, spend my time there. Yeah. So while you're going to school, then eventually you also got involved, as you said, with the newscast. And and you had mentioned you were probably the most and, and it really was a precursor to what your career path was. Yeah. You have this you know, ability to transform into news, sports and weather. I did. And I want to say that. I started doing sports as a second semester freshman because I'm pretty sure when I was still living at Wetzel that I was doing uh, the, ch the channel three news as a sports anchor. I did it for a year or two. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, I've done this. Can I, can I do something else? So I do news anchored for a semester or two. And I thought you, and maybe you, I thought the department had a, uh, a requirement that if you were going to do weather, you had to be enrolled in the meteorology school. And I, I wasn't, but I think there was a year where you couldn't find anybody to do like a Thursday weather or something. So I said, well, I'll, 
I can make a weather map. I can learn enough about this. So would you let me do it? And I think, I think Sharon and you guys and Sam let me go ahead and do weather. So at one point in time, I'd done all three. Yeah. <laughs> well, in some cases, you just have to hope that, uh, you know, the, the person can be acquainted enough with the information to present yeah. it in a, in a, in a way that is pleasurable to the audience. How's that? So, uh, yeah, no, normally we do ask people to be meteorology majors or minors, but uh, we bend the rules every once in a while for somebody. <laughs> um, and, and another thing that you had mentioned, which was I'd forgotten probably what exact year, but Sam had and Sharon had managed to get for those interested in sports broadcasting an RV yeah. that was purchased by the university. <laughs> and it was, it was a shabby thing that we used for years, but it was probably one, of, as you said, uh, initiated when you were an undergrad, right? Yeah. And to, I was, I was thinking about it and, you know, if you've watched the show Breaking Bad, I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a step too far from Walter White and Jesse Pinkman's RV that they drove around. Now we were, we were broadcasting out of, we weren't doing illicit things out of that thing, but I, every once in a while you were surprised if it actually started from the parking lot right behind Steel Hall and you could get it over to, uh, over to Hanson Field or, or, or get it to the, the field house for football or, or basketball games. But you guys outfitted that with, like a, a mini switcher and there were, we dragged cables there for all the cameras and everything else. And we would park it behind the press box at, at Hanson field. And I, Michael Morrissey, who was one of my broadcast partners, both at WKAI. And then Michael came back and went to school at Western uh, as, as a slightly older guy. And Michael was doing play by play. And I did the color commentary for at least two years of Western football. I don't think we ever did very much Western basketball, but I do remember maybe a basketball game or two, but we certainly did a lot of those football games, Michael and I, and we did them during the Aaron Stecker years and really uh, a couple of very, very good Western football oh, yeah. seasons in, in the mid to late nineties when they were challenging at the top of what I still call division one, double a football, but that, that, that old Winnebago was, was really something. And I'm sure at the time I thought it was really cool. It was hyper cutting edge and, and everything was great, but those were, those were neat times because I, to sit there and to get set up and to do a television broadcast of those football games someplace, I know I still have a couple of them on VHS tapes laying around here. So I have to see if I can get them, get them working again. <laughs> well, that, that old RV, I think lasted until, uh, it was rusting through. And, and as you said, uh, trying to get it up the hill to get it parked back into Slee, it took about a half a tank of gas. So <laughs> it was, it was a monster. And unfortunately we got a new truck and, and, uh, we've expanded all the things that we we're doing. You mentioned, uh, a few people, um, I know there are other faculty that were impactful. Uh, Sharon Evans, you'd mentioned Sam. I'm sure Roger Sadler, um, other you know, students and uh, faculty that you remember from those days. Yeah, I, you know Roger was was really great. Um, he was always available to all of us as students. And just talking about somebody that talking to somebody the other day about a, a thing that happened in the news. And I remember being in Roger's office one of those days when, when some of these big news stories were breaking and it, we were in TV broadcasting and we were trying to be broadcast journalists. So it always seemed as Roger had CNN on or something like that. And in his office and we could come in and sit back in a lounge and kind of watch TV and see what was, what was being broadcast that day. And so his door was always open to us. And I always remember very fondly of being, being connected to Roger. He'd even have us over for, to his house for, for taco nights. And, uh, he was kind enough to invite a bunch of probably at that point in time, pretty hungry and bored college students over to his place and cook his tacos. And, uh, but, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, Everett Nelson too, one of oh, the, Everett, yeah. the uh, technology guys, our, our technician that fixed a lot of really out of date broadcasting equipment at that point in time, three quarter inch decks with the cable from the oh camera you hold on your shoulder or the cable to run down to the deck. And that cable never seemed to work quite right. And <laughs> Everett was always able to fix it and kind and willing to show people how to do things and how to even kind of adjust on the fly when you're out in the field. And, you know, those are those college professors. It took me a minute to remember everybody's name, you know, and, Oh, that's right. But then, once you do hear buzz, the, the memories come back and you just remember how helpful and impactful people people were to help you on your journey. 
Yeah, and you had some great students you were working with. You mentioned Michael Morrissey, who was, as you mentioned, he had a professional gig in the morning at, mm-hmm. at K100 um, and, and came back and was terrific. He did news. He did play-by-play. He really was an important part of what we were doing with our programming. But uh, also Cisco was, was yeah. an undergrad. Yeah, other students that you remember working with? Yeah, and you know Cisco and I, we'd hosted, there was a community affairs program or something on channel three that I think we mm-hmm. did for a little while. And we even kind of tried to do a, an early version of a, of a WIU coaches show here and there, I think. That's so right. we've done a, a couple of the longer form programs, uh, that, uh, that we put together. And, you know, many of those students are, are the people that you remember spending all that time with and trying to figure out what you were going to do and how you were going to get, you know, going in this, in this broadcasting world They they were really, really great to work with. Yeah, terrific times. And so um, you, you, you get through your undergrad time. And what was your plan? Did, because you had that ability, you had some, some experience in radio, you have uh, experience down television. What were, you, what were your goals to, and, and what did it look like after graduation? I, I wanted a job. <laughs> you didn't care. <laughs> just a job. Yeah, I just absolutely needed a job. I was fortunate. The Rams, uh, if you know, now students, I, I guess students watch this buzz, but um, yeah. if you're a student watching this, the St. Louis Rams were the St. Louis Rams, okay? They, they weren't always in, in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the St. Louis football Rams had their training camp at Western, and they would stay in Thompson Hall, and they would practice on the football fields just the other side of, of Thompson and, and Brophy Hall. And so they were there for a number of years while I was an undergrad, and then while while I graduated and there was a television station in Quincy there too, but channel 10 WGEM had a uh, open position for an internship and a sports internship. And it actually paid a little bit. So I thought, boy, I'd like to apply for that and make just, I think it was $1,500 for about two or three months of, of work in Quincy, but they gave me free room and board in Quincy, which was also appealing. <laughs> I could move to Quincy and stay for free, even in the uh, luxurious place that they put me up. But I, I got that internship with uh, WGEM and Quincy. I was essentially the sports director at the time. He was also named Steve, Steve Luton, mm-hmm. pretty much let me stay in Macomb. I'd go back and forth. I stayed a lot in Quincy, but if I could go to Macomb and cover the Rams and training camp, he let me, then I could just stay at my mom and dad's house. And then I go back to Quincy with a couple of days worth of tape and some stories. And so I covered that, that Rams training camp. And I guess I did it pretty well. Quincy Newspapers at the time owned the television station. They had one in Bluefield, West Virginia. They had a station in Rockford, they had a station in Quincy. I think they might have owned one other property. But they were, at that point, looking for a weekend sports anchor and a sports director. But they were looking for a weekend sports anchor in Rockford at WREX-TV. And I, I guess I'd done a, a good enough job while in while in Quincy that I was able to interview for that job at WREX in Rockford and, and got my got my really first paying TV job going to uh, going to Rockford. So during, and just for people that don't know those Rams teams, those are Super Bowl the you know, and, and packed with the Hall of Famers on that team. Yeah. Uh, you don't realize how big people are until you interview Orlando Pace and you just go instinctively to shake his hand and then his hand kind of covers up your entire hand and you say, you know, uh, 21 years old or whatever, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Pace or whatever else. There, there's a funny story there, though, Buzz, because so Steve and I kept in touch a little bit. And when I was doing that, that training camp, the last training camp that I did, and that was the training camp in which they eventually won their first Super Bowl. Now, Trent Green was the quarterback, and so everything was surrounding Trent Green, and it was all about, you know, Trent Green and Dick Vermeil and talk to these people, these people. Well, Kurt Warner was in camp, and Kurt Warner had played uh, in the same conference as Western had, and he'd kind of been this, he was at least a story to me. Hey, you know, this guy played at Western, and he played for you and I, he played for, you know, University of Northern Iowa, we should you should give me, you know, five or 10 minutes and I'll track Kurt Warner down and we'll do a couple of stories about him. And, you know, it, it'll be really interesting. Right, Steve? And, ah, nobody's ever going to hear about that guy again, kid. Like, you know, he's, <laughs> this is, this is Trent Green's team and you know, the, do, don't even waste your time. I, I, I don't think I have time to air it. So, okay. And then I'm in Rockford at the time and I'm watching a, a preseason football game highlight package and there goes Trent Green and here comes Kurt Warner. I happened to call Steve a couple of weeks later. I said, Hey, so nobody's ever going to hear a Kurt Warner. I probably should have done that story, not knowing what was eventually going to happen. And then Kurt Warner turns into a Hall of Fame quarterback and goes to two Super Bowls with the Rams. And 
So you could have been in this movie. I, I yeah, maybe I would have been the yeah, just right after you know packing grocery bags at High V or whatever Kurt did in uh, in Cedar Falls, Iowa. But never never skip a story because you never quite know who you might wind up talking to and how it might turn out. So you're in Rockford, Illinois, uh, and doing sports there. How how long were you there? Two and a half years, probably two years, a little, little more than two, two and a half years. And um, so what were the sort of joys and challenges of working in in Rockford? Uh, the challenges is I still remember one of the first days, I think maybe the first story I shot, because you're still carrying your own camera, you're a one man bandit. I don't know if we still call it that or whatever, but MMJs. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you're, you're doing all your own video. You're doing all your own reporting. I came back. I was so excited. I shot an entire story without any NAS sound, which was which was really, really excellent. So all the video is, was very quiet of this BMX race that I'd done while trying to get my first story off the ground in Rockford. I remember, though, I remember that, but I was shooting news at the same time. So I was doing weekend sports. I was anchoring on Saturdays and Sundays. And I was probably shooting a little bit of sports on on the evenings, baseball games or football games, obviously basketball games, stuff like that. But during the day, otherwise, I was shooting spot news and running live trucks for people. So, you know, doing that, doing what you do to get your very first job often in TV and, and taking care of all of it. I told you so, you know, in 1999, I graduate or Y2K, the millennium is changing. I spent that New Year's Eve night with a reporter in the basement of the Rockford County building with the coroner, Sue Fiducia, and a couple other people because nobody knew what was going to happen on Y2K. Would, would the world end? So my news director said, you guys can be here all night long. And you know, it's like 12 and nothing happens. And it's 1230. And we're like, it's one well, o'clock. People didn't morning. understand that they thought the computers would not work after yeah. they thought, at, you know, when it switched to 2000, the computers wouldn't work anymore. Yeah, how much of this are we going to have to explain to people, Buzz? I feel now it's like a time capsule. The, the, the Rams used to play in St. Louis, and there was this thing called Y2K that was going to close down everybody's computer. Yeah, uh, but I, you know, th- those were th- those were fun days. Um, it, it again, it kept me uh, able to do a lot of different things. I was shooting news, I was reporting news on the edges. Obviously, is kind of the, the photographer that would go out with a set of questions. I did live shots. I, I. Uh, uh, I was a news reporter on a couple of live shots because there wasn't anybody else in, in the studio or available to do it that day. So I covered a couple of early mayoral uh, victory parties, or I, I think they actually sent me to the guy that lost who wound up later being uh, the, the mayor of Rockford. But, you know, it was one of those times where it was just kind of, it was fun. It was all hands on deck. It was, you're around. Okay, let's, we trust you. Let's go do this. So that's where you met your wife? Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we were out. She had worked at a radio station in Rockford that doesn't exist anymore. I think they they turned off the signal. It was technically in in Rockton, right near the state line in between Wisconsin and Illinois. And uh, another weather person, a weather guy at the station was doing weather on their radio station. So we were all out one night and we met and that was that. Nice. So yeah, it's at some point, though, you uh, have an opportunity to go back towards us to yeah. Springfield, Illinois, to the state's capital. How did that happen? Uh, they eliminated my position at WREX, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which will be a, which will be a revolving theme in the, in the, uh-huh. in the conversation with me. Uh, it, fast forward to the end of the uh, end of the video where we, you know, tell students about, you know, how to be prepared for all of this is uh, get prepared to be flexible and get prepared to, to deal quickly with, with the changing whim sometimes of, uh, of broadcast journalism and broadcast TV. But, they had kind of decided that oh, for a moment or two, they didn't want anybody doing weekend sports at the station. And that was me. And the position was eliminated at the end of December, the first of January. I spent a couple of weeks trying to find a new place to get to. And of all the different places I looked, Springfield and uh, WICS TV was at that point in time, I think it was really the first thing that, that came up. And I said, sure, that's not bad. I can stay in Illinois. I don't have to move too far. Right. Uh, moved to the capital city. They just hired a sports director too. So we were kind of brand new to the market together and uh, got settled in for a couple more years there. And what's kind of an interesting part about your story is that you moved to Springfield and and you probably really didn't think, okay, this is going to be an important place in my life. Right. You know, it's just going to be in one of the places. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the really one of the reasons I wanted to do what I'm doing is I thought that I'd be able to move 
place to place and live in a place for two and a half, three years, four years, and then pack up and move. And I, I, I figured I'd move like great long distances, right? I'd, I'd want to see all different portions of the country, that type of uh, transient lifestyle. Maybe it sounds bad, but that, that kind of moving around and going from one market to the next was really, really appealing to me. And I tell people, look, I, I got really close. I, I got to Quincy on the Mississippi River. I got to within 14 miles of of Wisconsin in Rockford. And then I just decided, I guess I'd move to the dead center of Illinois and, <laughs> and stay in the capital city for apparently for the next 20, 22 years at this point. But uh, it, it was a good opportunity. I eventually became sports director at the, at the TV station and really was able to settle in and just do television sports anchoring, which is really what I wanted to do at that point. I didn't, I didn't have a ton of interest. I had a lot of fun shooting news. I really enjoyed the, the pace of it and the excitement of going to breaking news stories and you know being involved in all of it. But I really wanted to be a, a sports anchor. And I did get to do that for a number of years at Channel 20 in Springfield. So you there probably with a heavy emphasis on covering a uh, local high school. Yeah. And um, I think uh, there's minor league baseball with the, was there Springfield Cardinals? Well, the Cardinals had moved on. Okay. And they, I think a year or two before I came to town was kind of the last time they had a baseball. So we used to have years ago, we used to have the AAA Cardinals. St. Louis Cardinals were, were the Springfield Cardinals. And I think guys like Willie McGee and, and the like, the, the very, very early 80s Cardinals moved through town. And then that just kind of slowly eroded. Major League Baseball is looking for bigger places to put teams. And I think eventually we were down to an A program for maybe the Royals or a, a team like that. But Springfield's just a, an outstanding high school sports town. And you quickly realized that when you moved to town, you were going to cover high school sports. And, you know, the, the very first winter I moved here, there was a young man who was going to Lanford High School named Andre Iguodala. And Andre was the most phenomenal high school basketball player I've ever seen in person. And Andre then spent two years at Arizona and has had, you know, essentially has just wrapped up a near Hall of Fame yeah. NBA career, uh, starting out with, you know, kind of finishing up with with what Golden State and, and being just an unbelievable basketball player. But we've had a, a, a huge long list of professional baseball players that have come through town. We've had guys that are now in the NFL that I've covered recently that have played high school football in Springfield. Uh, we've had professional race car drivers that are from Springfield, drag racers and NASCAR, uh, professional NASCAR racers that are from town. And so it's, it's this community is really unlike any other I've seen or heard about or even been in for a town this size, the amount of pro sport athletes that you get out of here is it's just it's I think it's kind of unheard of and they all come through high school obviously and it's it's just one of the biggest things around high school football Friday nights for the big city schools to the smaller outlying schools and and just a, a heck of a baseball and basketball tradition too absolutely and um, you know looking back now uh, after you have some separation from that time Steve I'm wondering um, what kind of things did you learn about, you know, being a professional or kind of skills that uh, you were developing that you were kind of putting into your tool belt? You really had to learn how to always connect to people and to always let them help you be better. Right. And that's a real cornerstone of being a broadcaster and being a journalist is knowing who to call. Mm -hmm. But it's also knowing that they're going to call you if something important is happening because not that they trust you to, well, I guess that they, they trust you to, to tell the story in the right way that they, that they know that you're going to want to know, and you're going to be able to tell everybody else what's going on. And so if you know, you can pick up that phone and call somebody right away because you heard about something, or if you know that you, something you didn't hear about or didn't know, somebody's going to call you back and say, Hey, you guys need to be out here and you need to be looking at this, this is really special, or this is going to happen today, or this person is doing this. And so it's, it's that connection. And you got to treat sports like that, the way that we saw state house reporters and government reporters in town do the exact same thing, right? It's, they're, they're sources, but, but they're basically just relationships with people that want to also, you know, be able to help you do your job. So after working in sports there, you got out of the media business and into a job in PR, which yeah. um, is not unlike many of the stories that we hear. So what kind of skills transfer to the new position? I guess just 
basically the, those same skills, making sure you could tell stories, making sure you're going to be able to write quickly. Uh, the skills that didn't translate, though, were working on deadline and having five different things to do in a day and starting the day with a blank slate and finishing with the product and having it done and out there and then completely restarting the next day, then, you know, building it back up and putting it back out there and restarting the next day. So the pace of PR is what just the pace of an office job is, is just what shocked me and how long you sometimes have to do projects and how, um, I don't know, in, in, in the way I look at things, how excruciatingly boring that, that can be to, to not have the deadline pressure, to not have it be new every every single day to, to have something that you're going to say, oh, you've got you've got two weeks to, to get this done or you've got four days to write a press release or try to find the exact right way to put this together. But the pace of it was different, but the skills of writing, of knowing things, uh, uh, of who to call and try to get your uh, company or association's message out and how to best promote it. And then when you did need to reach out to the news media and you needed to set up a press event or people were calling for an issue because it was going to be in the news, all those skills you had as a reporter, you just used in reverse to deal with reporters and to deal with any sort of news media that you were going to, going to handle that day. So the transition back to the media, how and why? I mean, did you just miss it that much or? I did. I was really bored and... <laughs> I don't know if, I, if my former employer wants to hear that or not, but I, I remember one of the first days I was at that, that PR job and I just sat in this quiet, quiet office and nobody was talking. There, there weren't scanners going off. There wasn't the din of people coming in and going out. There wasn't the shift work style where midday people were in and evening people were in for a brief period and they crossed over and, and there just wasn't any of that, uh, any of that going on in the background. So I needed something to do differently. I had to have that change to, to really still enjoy what I was doing. And I wasn't, I had worked at this AM radio station part-time hosting a sports talk show a couple of days a week. And their agribusiness director, their farm director, their farm reporter had, had quit. Uh, she was going to go do something else. She was getting in, into PR at the time. And I figured that they'd have a hard time finding somebody to replace Leah. So I thought about it, but I didn't say anything right away. And then it had been a month or two and they were still looking for somebody. And so I remember talking to my general manager at the time and I said, Hey, would you hire me to do that? You like, what do you know about farming? Nothing, but I, I kind of don't want to do what I'm doing anymore. And I, I think I can do this. And I think I probably got the brush off for about a week or two and they still didn't have anybody. They couldn't find anybody to do the job, find anybody that they wanted to do the job. So I asked one more time and they said, okay. And I didn't know anything about farming and I didn't know anything yeah. about agriculture, but I, I, I started and, and I guess I learned. Well, I think that it, it can be very similar to, to news in that aspect. I mean, even if you feel that you're familiar with, with, uh, with topics of the day, when you move into a community, you have to know th who the people are. You have to know what the subjects are. And, and so everything is, you, you're learning uh, a whole new set of uh, things that you need to communicate. And so it's not unlike that. And I'll just admit this. You, I don't know if you ever knew this. When Larry Derry retired at K100, um, I took this <laughs> from WLRB. I was the farm director for oh. a short period of time. Didn't know anything either. But I, I figured, well, I'm supposed to be a communicator. And I just need to find, uh, do my homework. I, I did not know you had Larry's job and Larry's name is one of those names that popped up in my head. I'm like, man, I, I should have paid a lot more attention to whatever Larry Derry was doing outside of all the sports <laughs> broadcasting for K100. I should have woken up really early in the morning to listen to the farm report because otherwise I have no clue what I'm about ready to, to go do. But I found that a lot of my contacts through working in sports, so much of that was in smaller towns, the towns outside of the city of Springfield where I'd go and do something and somebody'd say, oh, I, you know, I remember seeing you on the sidelines of Auburn football games, or I remember when you did this with our, our school in Pawnee, or, or you were over here and we loved watching you, or even if they didn't have a connection to that, to their small town high school, they, they, they were sports fans. So you did this when you, when you covered Illinois, or tell me about, you know, a, a Bruce Weber story and covering a final four basketball team. And I thought, okay, this, this works out well. A lot of the people I'm talking to now are the people that used to watch me do something else that they really enjoyed. And here I'm just covering 
covering different things, but you, you go in open-minded, you go in ready to ask a lot of questions, you go in ready to know that you don't know everything that you're going to talk to somebody about, which maybe makes your questions perhaps better or at least different than the way other people cover it. And uh, so far it's worked out. And, and obviously there, there are joys you're getting out of being involved in broadcasting again in that way. It is. Uh, and it, it filled, it filled a void or filled that need just to, to have that job of, I guess it's creativity, but it's also just, um, it's, it's, it's being really interested in a whole lot of different things. And it's just that kind of desire to, to find out new things and to be involved in something totally different. And I've just always kind of had that desire in my life to, to just to learn more about different things and to kind of always have something unique happen every single day. And, and that, that certainly is, is broadcasting. It's not an office job. If you're looking for different things to do every day and new people to talk to and new experiences, then you're absolutely going to, going to find it and in, in trying and in being a, being a journalist. Yeah. And it's amazing to me because uh, I, you know, people can become very one dimensional, but I see all that personal growth in your life to where you've had these opportunities, these things that have come up and you, you were up to the challenge and, uh, uh, and I'm happy for you for for that, um, having the courage and the self-confidence to take those on. Um, I'm wondering, Steve, you know, now that you, you've been out over 20 years, what kind of advice that you have for a young person um, that's trying to find their way like you did, you know, back in the 90s? Well, it's, it, it's, it's be flexible. You know, I mean, that's if anything, that's that's what my career has taught me. This isn't what I thought. I would be doing. I, it's not what I thought I wanted to be doing. I mean, there were there were other career goals that have, you know, quite honestly, just they didn't happen and they didn't get me to where that I thought I wanted to be or maybe where I, I guess I'm where I need to be. But it's not what I I kind of set out to do. And as you stay flexible and you give yourself that opportunity to do a whole bunch of different things, and you find out you can you can achieve a lot of those goals, but they're just going to look different, right? They're, they're not going to be exactly as you have it laid out. I'd say though, the one thing that I've, I've really learned this over the last couple of years, and I'm, I'm not particularly good at it, but it's certainly what I see uh, a trend in the industry. I'd be really multidimensional in trying to make sure that what you're doing, you can kind of sell to somebody else you, anymore. You gotta, ha you have to have a business plan. I think being a broadcaster, because there are a lot of people I know now that are very successful at this that aren't really broadcasters. They're they're podcasters mm -hmm. and they're doing things that, with their own brand that other people are just coming directly to them to do to say, hey, we'll support you as as your advertiser. It's not that the advertising dollar rolls through to the television station, to the news general manager, you know, news director down to you. You get to be your own. You get to be your own brand. And that was not the case when when I was going through school. And that hasn't been the case, I think, except for the last couple of years. And so maybe this generation of college students buzz is a little bit more in tune to that. But if you got some business sense, maybe you take some marketing classes, maybe you take some business classes, maybe you have a minor as that really learn how to market and prop yourself up a bit then I think you've got an advantage in dealing with the way that, that media, the way I see it is, is kind of going. Well, that, I think that's great. I think you're, you're, you're right in a lot of those ways the the media business continues to evolve and, and we need to adapt um, both as teachers and students uh, to, to the way that that's changing. It's been so great catching up with you, Steve. I, I tell you, it's, it's, uh, it's been too long. <laughs> I agree. So, uh, Next time uh, you come back from Macomb, uh, maybe we can go and see the new sports truck and see how the broadcasters are doing. That would be excellent. If I can ever get back there, it's been a while, but I look forward to my next trip back to Macomb for sure, Buzz, and we'll catch up. Okay. And thanks for all the viewers out there for watching every week. If you want to be uh, uh, a, ne a guest in a future episode, just send me an email. We want to hear from our alums, and we hope that you continue to watch and listen to the podcast and generally appreciate everyone's support. So until next week, stay safe, take care, and God bless. <laughs>